for a minute or so while attendees come in and then I'll welcome them. Aloha, my name is Roger Jelinek. I'm executive director of the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. And it's my pleasure to welcome you attendees and to in, uh, uh, welcome this panel uh, by remarkable histo local historian, Tom Kaufman and his esteemed past colleagues and without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Susan Chandler, who will be, will be moderating this session. Mahalo. Okay, thank you, Roger, and thank you for doing this for so many years. I think this is a wonderful um, book and music festival. So my name is Susan Chandler, and I um, am moderating this panel. Uh, we already uh, have, know that Tom Kaufman, esteemed author, is going is here talking about his new book. And we also have Stephen Morse, who is an uh, old-time social worker, used to be at QLCC, previous executive director of the Blueprint for Change. We're happy to have him on the panel as well. Um, I would just like to say uh, a few words, and then I'm going to give it to Tom to take it off. So the name of this book that we're talking about today is How Social Work Changed Hawaii, From Practice to Social Justice, and it is hot off the press. It's just coming out from Watermark. You'll be able to get it shortly. Um, I, I uh, have been involved with a small group of social workers who have been kind of an advisory board to Tom as we um, helped him uh, think through some of the issues that he was thinking about, helped him uh, interview some of the people who were in the book. And um, the little advisory group that worked with him is made up of Dave, um, Debbie Shimizu, Sharon Otagaki, and Chris Langworthy. And the book uh, is dedicated to Jeanette Matsumoto, who was a well-known social worker in the past and uh, passed away about five or six years ago, I think, she came up with the idea that social workers really from older social workers really need to tell their story and make sure that the younger social workers in the profession know what the field is about. So the impetus for this book arose from a group of social workers who wanted their profession to be better understood, not only in terms of the compassion that everybody knows about social workers, but also about the active passion that continues to make a better world. And um, the, we, this group um, worried that the fire of social work and social justice um, was at best smoldering. And we wanted to fan the embers and see whether or not the next generation of social workers are gonna be, uh, are gonna continue the, um, the wonderful path that had already been um, set out by social workers in Hawaii. So Tom was asked to write this book and it began way, way, way back, maybe five or six years ago with the National Association of Social Workers, local chapter, asking Tom to um, interview some of the senior social workers in town and um, ask them some questions about their lives and how they saw the arc of social justice change throughout the last 50 years in Hawaii. And so that's what Tom did. And Tom, why don't you tell us about the book? Okay, uh, Colin, could we have a slide up? Um, uh, there is the book cover. The book cover is going to be uh, blue and brown, but it's, uh, it's reduced to uh, black and white here. Uh, Watermark is publishing it. Uh, I'd like to thank them for 
their interest taking on a um, uh, a social uh, set a set of social issues, um, and uh, it reflects their intense interest in uh, life in Hawaii and uh, the quality and nature of society in Hawaii. Uh, so um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, uh, that was, um, as Susan said, uh, the impetus for this book arose from social workers who wanted their profession to be understood not only in terms of compassion, but an active passion to make a better world. And then uh, in the process, um, we had extensive discussions about uh, who defined this in our history and how the idea of social justice had evolved from the practice of social work. And uh, immediately we came up with, we meaning the, the group of senior social workers. And I was familiar with her. I met her at a party at the Thompson's house. Um, she was really the grand lady of social work uh, in her old age, uh, but she was an amazing person. Uh, Clarinda Lucas, if we could go to that slide. Uh, one of my lines about Clorinda is she was born in the 19th century. She is still an influence now. She's an influence in the 21st century. Uh, she went off to, at a time when social work wasn't really recognized as a profession, and certainly a Hawaiian social worker was not recognized. She went off to Columbia University and with uh, as a single mom uh, taking her one child, who turned out to be Laura Thompson, um, and got a master's degree in social work at the Columbia School of Social Work. And then she came home and was hired basically into what then was the county welfare department to implement the then new uh, federal system, social security system of welfare payments under Mayor Johnny Wilson, which goes way, way back. Um, and so she had an, a really amazing career uh, starting in the you know uh, 1930s and it extended all the way into the 1960s when she retired to what was really perhaps her most important work, which was as a, the, really the lead trustee of the Queen Liliwokalani Children's Center and where she played a transformative role, which we'll get into a little later. Uh, the second person we chose was Aquan McElrath. And again, that was one of those things where there's no debate. Uh, Aquan was a person who loomed like a giant in everyone's thinking. Uh, she was proudly a lifelong radical, a labor organizer. She became the social worker of the International Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union, where she was involved in all sorts of things, supporting strikes, uh, defining, sorting through benefits, making sure people got their benefits. And in that process, particularly with a focus on healthcare, she became an important part of the ILWU's legislative program and was a key voice for the development of Hawaii's then unique prepaid healthcare system. She also advocated for, in, for um, in, increased welfare benefits um, and uh, all, all sorts of services that had to do with helping people uh, cope 
with the, with the, the problems of life. Um, and then the third person who was uh, like uh, uh, also uh, a person who was uh, deceased, recently deceased was Myron Pinky Thompson for whom the School of Social Work is named. There's a really interesting story about Pinky being war wounded. And uh, actually during World War II, he was pushed into the role of scout because he was a native and native Indians were pushed into the role of scout, which was an extremely perilous uh, job, right? Uh, he made it past the beach at Normandy, but was shot going through France, and he was shot in the eye, of all things, and survived. His head was wrapped and treated. This injury was treated over like a two, a two to three year period, during which time he basically could not see. And he talked about that as a time where he developed his and clarified and sharpened his sense of purpose. He talked about clarity of vision. Uh, through Queen Lily Okalani Children's Center, uh, he began the process of developing a Hawaiian Western bicultural approach to social work, turning to Hawaii's uh, cultural past. And I think we can talk about that uh, extensively as we go. Uh, he was a real breakthrough person in, uh, this, in the field of social work, occupying high level government positions. Uh, Governor John Burns, brought him into the governor's office to be his chief of staff. He then ran the Department of Human Services and later ran the Department of Hawaiian Homes. Thereafter, he became a Bishop of State trustee where he played a transformative role, pushing the estate into looking at communities, which is where his orientation was and providing services for pregnant mothers, very early childhood uh, period, uh, you know, like birth to age two and uh, developing uh, preschools. Um, his arguably most impactful role was rescuing Hawaiian Polynesian voyaging at a time when it, it was going through an early developmental crisis and he was the steadying hand and then the behind the scenes visionary. And it was often said he approached Hopulea as a social worker. Uh, the fourth person was closely related to Myra. Masaru Oshiro. Uh, Masaru took over uh, when, when Governor Burns drafted Myron to go to the Capitol. Uh, he turned to Masaru and said, uh, you know, you've got to take over the ship. And uh, uh, reluctantly, Masaru did so, and, but became really beloved and uh, played all sorts of important roles. Um, public conscience of opposition to capital punishment in Hawaii being one of them. Uh, he supported young activists. He oversaw the publication, the development of the information base and the publication of the bicultural Nana Ike Kumu. Uh, he later became administrator of Alulike, which is the native Hawaiian uh, 
uh, employment training and placement agency. Uh, and in his retirement, he did remarkable disaster relief workers through the Red Cross. Um, uh, for example, he spent six weeks doing grief counseling at the World Trade Center uh, site after the 9-11 uh, attack. Uh, the fifth person was, if you could change the slide, um, was a, uh, an extension of this movement, which in a kind of social work genealogy traced from uh, Clorinda to Myron to Masaru and Lynette Paglinawan uh, in concert with her husband, the late Richard Lekeke Paglinawan, uh, took the teachings of the cultural icon, Mary Kavena Pukui, and became, became the lead practitioner and teacher of the revived practice of Ho'oponopono, which is the family strengthening family conflict resolution practice that has been extended to extended families, uh, to whole communities. So it's an important, important part of our uh, revived culture today. She presently teaches at the University of Hawaii at West Oahu. And uh, the, our next person, Patty Lyons. Uh, again, an absolutely amazing story. Patty came here in the 60s as a young social worker uh, who insisted that she be given a challenging assignment. She didn't want to just do casework at Child and Family Service. And so uh, the director agreed, okay, Patty, we can send you out to YNI one day a week. And in the process, she exposed child abuse, which had been ignored. Child abuse uh, occurred beyond uh, sight and beyond public consciousness. She exposed the existence of child abuse and uh, led the legislative process by which child abuse was defined and criminalized and also treated through intervention agency uh, within Department of Human Services, the uh, Child uh, Protective Service. Uh, she later led the agency, uh, Child and Family Service, and in that role, she reached out to the Philippines and began working with a remarkable woman named Consuelo Alger, who turned out to be enormously wealthy and moved by Patty's deep concern and expertise in the field of abuse and more broadly social services, established the international, meaning based in Hawaii and very active in the Philippines, Consuelo Foundation. Consuelo Foundation today uh, does good work in Hawaii and it projected Hawaii social work uh, throughout the Philippines in amazing ways. I've actually been there with it. Um, the next person we focused on was Andrew I.T. Chang. Uh, Andy was uh, set out in life to be an engineer. Actually, he was following the um, uh, wishes of his father, but he got hung up on being a youth worker at Salvation Army and loved it and uh, changed careers, uh, became an anti-poverty worker, 
quickly became director of the Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, and uh, then the director of the Human Services Department succeeding, succeeding um, Myron Thompson, who he worked with closely, and then was managing director of the city and county of Honolulu. And finally, the person we're with today, uh, Dr. Susan Chandler, who started out as pictured here with ben, Governor Ben Cayetano when she was sworn in to be human services director. So look how many social workers became high level uh, government uh, administrators during this period. Uh, she started out as a uh, sort of a uh, rough and tumble student activist. She became a professor of social work. Uh, after being human services director, she uh, did work uh, through the social work school and also became director for 10 years of the university's public policy institute. And with that sort of hurried intro of the people, uh, I'll turn it back to Susan and to uh, Steve Morris is with us, a veteran social worker, uh, for a reflection on what these people meant to them and to the community. I hurried, I, I hurried through them by way of introduction. No, and I think what's, what's very important about the book is that each chapter digs into these people's lives and, um, and shows how important the practice of social work is and was to the changes that uh, were taking place in Hawaii and the development of, of social justice. I think most people think of social workers as kind of clinical practitioners who are helping children and families. And, and that's a very important part of social work. But there's also this kind of activism piece that all of these um, people in the, from described in the, in the chapters um, you know, reflect. And that's kind of what the book is about. One of the themes that I thought was interesting is, as I was rereading the book is the development of the um, indigenous practice and the respect for um, Hawaiian practices and Hawaiian culture. And um, you know, many of us who went to schools on the mainland, you don't get much um, <laughs> indigenous practice respect that you kind of get a Western, teaching and um, even a lot of the Saul Alinsky and the various kinds of community activism um, wasn't really fit very well for, um, for Hawaii in some ways. And I think these people right from the very beginning, Kalinda all the way on, um, had a respect for um, Hawaiian culture, wanted to bring the wisdom of Hawaiian practice to Hawaii. And um, one of the things that I did when I was at the Department of Human Services was set up a very different way of looking at child welfare services and building on Ho'oponopono and the work of Lynette and um, Richard Puglianuan and, and respecting culture and the ohana and the way families can use their own strengths to solve problems. And um, Steve, who worked at QLCC and also worked with Masaro, also has a um, interesting history of, of developing his own understanding of Hawaiian culture and um, social work practice. And so maybe Steve, would you like to say a few words? Sure. <clears throat> um, and, and back during my time, this shows how far back I go, um, QLCC wasn't even known as QLCC at the time. It was still called the Liliokalani Trust, and it's now gone back to being called the Liliokalani Trust. Um, but for a long time after it, it became the Queen Liliokalani Children's Center, um, when I, I was hired by Masaro in 1968. He had taken over um, after Pinky left to go assume the uh, roles in the state government, but um, my my major influence on on my life was was Masaru Oshiro, definitely. 
Um, he was, I think, the most compassionate man um, I've ever met in my life. Um, and I think Tom writes about it where he, he actually sacrificed his job as a deputy director of um, public safety at the time, I think, because he, um, he disagreed with the administration stance on, on, um, uh, on corporal, not corporal. Um, capital punishment. Capital punishment, sorry. Um, and he actually resigned rather than um, support the administration's role um, in, in trying to get capital punishment um, restored in Hawaii. And through his efforts, actually, I think it brought uh, a lot of public focus to it and it brought more attention to uh, the need to, you know, back off and, and become more compassionate. And as a result of that capital, we still don't have capital punishment today. Mm -hmm. So I think Masaro uh, is is owed a a big um, is a lot of gratitude for those of us who um, support more compassionate um, service to uh, those who are involved in um, capital crimes. But right. um, let me go back to, you know, Masaro, I mean, basically he was handed off um, the reins to the Liliokalani Trust by Pinky Thompson at a time when, when Pinky and, and I think through the uh, influence of Clorinda being on the, the board of the, the trustees, the Liliokalani Board of Trustees um, wanted to make it uh, a, a really um, Lily Okalani Trust, a real progressive, creative space for um, evolving the practice. And, and that included um, um, getting back into cultural roots. Uh, I, I recall one of the highlights of my life was I recall they, they created a, a, a culture committee and uh, it, it was set up so that social workers that worked at the Liliokalani Trust could bring, if, if they could bring cases to the culture committee where they um, either were concerned or questioned whether there were um, cultural, um, oh God, cultural implications in working with these families. Um, I, I remember one particular family that I worked with um, that, that had, um, when I took over the case, it had uh, um, aspects of the whole concept of noho, what they called noho or Hawaiian possession. And I brought it to the committee in order for and 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 I, I mean I was blessed that the committee was was led by a woman named um, Kavena Pukui, uh, who I think everybody knows, and I I still remember feeling like I was sitting in a room with royalty at the time with with Tutu Pukui because she was that esteemed at the time. She was well into her 80s already, uh, but still very sharp in talking about um, and, and explaining certain practices uh, that had maybe a, a family, uh, an ohana, uh, uh, ohana value to it. And, um, and, it and, and Masaru helped create that space. Um, it is where I got to meet um, Lynette Paglinawan and her husband, Richard. Both were employed at Lily Okolani at the time. So it was, they, Masaro helped create this really, really rich space for the culture to grow in practice. Um, okay. At the state, yeah, go ahead. 
No, no, I just want to, I want to get back to, <laughs> to Tom. Um, Tom, one of the other uh, things that I think is really interesting about the book is that um, we ran some focus groups and we talked to some young social workers who um, had interesting perspectives on what the profession is, what the future of social work is, what their commitment is. And I think there were some very strong themes that you can see all the way, you know, that Steve's talking about all the way through to now and to the future. You want to talk a little bit about uh, that part of the book? Yeah. Um, well, we had, you know, I think we had one, two, three. We had five different little group discussions. And... Uh, the probably the most recurring uh, theme was how many of the social workers were being uh, influenced by having their eyes opened by uh, the Hawaiian movement uh, that came up over and over. And they would they ranged from uh, interestingly they ranged from like students at um, Laie, BYU at Laie. For example, there were a lot of Pacific Islanders. Um, I remember a young man from Guam, another young lady from uh, Micronesia. Um, and they, they identified with uh, how Hawaiians had, are taking a hold and uh, are modifying social work to integrate cultural um, uh, knowledge. And they uh, are, you know, I think there was a, a, an inspiration and a respect that resulted from that. And uh, also I think it was, you know, the vital um, coursing of change, um, you know, discovery. Um, the traditions, the American uh, traditions, I don't think we're uh, transferring that strongly. I don't think people were uh, understanding things particularly well, like the New Deal and the anti-poverty uh, movement, which were like the New Deal really obviously um, FDR's New Deal uh, triggered uh, Clorinda to uh, extend herself. Um, the anti-poverty movement obviously uh, had uh, became an arena in which Myron Thompson did a lot of his important work or uh, uh, a little bit earlier than that, a person like Aquan McElrath was fired by the fired up by the idealism of the uh, you know that in between period that spanned the New Deal and the Great Society as it was called. Um, I I didn't uh, I I felt that the the sparks were there for these young people. Uh, they were, they had the basic impulse, and that is, I think, make the world better, which I think is a fundamental to social work, somehow relieve people's suffering, and then from there, try to pick up the pieces and formulate better approaches to life. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think, the, I, I think, society's overall concern for social justice is, has waned since the 1960s and 1970s. I think there's a downward trend and I think there needs to be a movement which will uh, pick these young people up and give them a stronger framework in which to uh, pursue their careers and uh, make a, the contribution to yeah. society that I think we know social work can make. 
I, I think we, um, you know, those of us who sort of were active in the 60s, I met you, I think, in Y&I with Patty Lyons and Lynette Paglina Juan in Y&I in 1968 or 1970. And and yeah. um, we were we were supported by a lot of the government programs, you know, model cities and community action. And there yeah. was a sense that the government was doing good with you, that you could work with communities and get funded to do important things. And I think that era has really changed. And yeah. um, while I, I agree, we heard a lot of passion and enthusiasm and, and interest in social justice. They don't look to the government to kind of um, the new social workers don't look to the government to kind of see that as a supportive environment anymore. They kind of feel they have to organize themselves, I think, and get it, get it going again. I think we were enriched and challenged by programs in which we had to get out in the field. Uh, yeah. and, and I mainly think of, you know, yourself and Steve and all the young people. I, uh, my, uh, I was a, a anti-poverty worker for a year um, and it was one of the great experiences of my life, but it was sort of between jobs in the, in the field of journalism. But nonetheless, I saw how the anti-poverty movement was waking people up, bringing people together. It was challenging government people to get more deeply involved in community life and sensitive to community needs. Right. And, in the, in, and in the doing, uh, great things uh, in terms of national legislation, such as Medicare, Medicaid, uh, uh, Economic Opportunity Act, um, Title IX, and so on and so on. All this legislation passed in the mid 1960s. And uh, so it was an interaction between government, the communities, uh, and a lot of really poor people. Yeah. I'm, 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 a lot of really poor people. And I'd like Steve to talk about his perception in that regard because uh, I know that. You, you more or less portrayed yourself as shocked by what you saw as sort of a middle class or privileged social work student. Well, you know, um, Masaro put me to work as a caseworker, you know, but I think he quickly saw that, um, you know, the anger in me was um, a, a, because I was so. I was so angry at the, the condition that Native Hawaiians were in um, for a large part. They were disproportionately and still are to a certain extent in, in all the social indicator categories. Um, and, and it was Masaro that helped turn me um, toward um, a different kind of social work more and allowed me to get more into working in communities and social action with, with different communities. Um, I don't see that kind of leadership today. And I think you're right, Tom, it's kind of waned, but I don't see that kind of leadership. Um, and, and, you know, among our, what, what they call Ali'i trusts, you know, in terms of Hawaiian leadership, you know, um, but um, Masaro was just allowed that, just just allowing that space at Halona Street to be used for the Muo Laulani site to be used for community social action groups to come in and use the facility after hours for some really rich and meaningful discussions moving forward on, you know, huge issues like self-determination and sovereignty and and native rights and claims and and those kinds of things were allowed to happen in that space and it it upset me years ago that they they actually do not they call it a kipuka now and they don't actually use that space for any kind of um 
quote unquote social service type role. So I, I you know, I kind of question whether there's the leadership that we need to take that to bring social justice back on the table and and being practiced again. Well, I do have a, a comment here, and we do want to open it up for questions from the audience. Sure. But um, we are someone is commenting that we are, had forgotten about Bernie Sanders and the progressives, and that certainly is a movement that's um, current and is hopefully um, bringing back some of the kinds of themes that um, that we've been talking about. Well, I, I, you know, I like Bernie Sanders because he's, I'm bald like he is bald. Um, <laughs> but in my, in my old Hawaiian suit, I would still look at him as a white man in a suit. I mean, and, and I, I learned from, I, I spent a lot of time interacting with American Indians and, and how they relate to, to government. And I, I, I respect Bernie for, his social democratic type ideals, but that's really, really far away from Hawaii and what we're doing, what's happening here. And I think we need to cultivate more leadership right here in the islands. Okay, well, maybe we can get some audience participation here. Um, I'm looking at the chat box and um, seeing that someone saying that their hopes were dashed a year ago when paid family leave and other important programs were cut out of the national legislation for the Build Back Better bill. So there's some um, discouragement about uh, the arc of social justice moving ahead at, in this era. I think, um, I think that's a really an important aspect of it. Um, and I, I came to, to that really by studying the lives of uh, people like uh, Clorinda and Pinky and Patty Lyons and uh, Masaru and others, um, because I could see how national legislation provided a springboard for people to uh, promote their, their basic instinct of you know, social improvement, social reform. And I think right now, and I think that's where Bernie Sanders comes into the picture. Bernie Sanders is sort of the left wing of the Democratic Party, which is struggling to revive, I think struggling to revive a, a national social conscience. And it's in the face of this horrendous uh, reactionary and uh, authoritarian movement that's going on uh, in the Republican party in opposition to it. And I think that's one of the ways in which our future is really up, to gra up for grabs. I think there's a federal dimension, there's a state level dimension, and I think there's a Hawaiian dimension mm -hmm. and how all of these work and play out and how people get involved in these dimensions and push a, an agenda of revived social conscience, mm -hmm. I think will uh, do a great deal to determine the health of our community in the future. And Roger is reminding us about the 2020 Aina Aloha movement and the organization has reignited many of these um, social issues. You know, there's a, um, there's a really cool uh, local organization that I, I totally love what they're doing. They're called the Hawaii People's Fund. Tom, you familiar with the Hawaii People's Fund? I am, yeah. And one of their founders was a woman named Nancy Alec. Nancy yeah, um, yeah, and and they are doing some some really good stuff on a grassroots level in terms of trying to fuel these these small little organizations, but not just 
get these organizations started, but have them working with each other um, on larger issues. And um, I, 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 I just hope that um, there's, there's more of that happening um, in the islands. Right. Tom, do you want to read the concluding sections? You were thinking about doing that? Hmm. I have it here. Okay, because we don't have too many, I don't have any questions in the chat box. So can, can I can I bring up one more thing, Susan? Sure. And and it has to do with your your story and, and about how you uh, and the latter part of your of Tom's writing about you is your your feelings that we need to as social workers begin to address the big elephant in the room and and that's how we deal with climate change and how social workers are going to be needed to deal with climate change and, and the huge migrations that are going to occur as the result of climate change. Um, we're gonna have huge refugee sites, right? I mean, that's basically, I, I, mean, I, hate, I hate to think of it, but we're gonna have have to create huge refugee centers around the world, you know? Yeah. Refugees from, for Pacific Islanders who are just Pacific great. Islanders from yeah, Africa, parts of Africa. Floods yeah. all over Asia. Yeah, it's going to be Asia. a huge problem. And I don't know this. Hopefully social workers will take the lead in figuring out how to deal with climate migrations and climate immigrants and all of those kinds of next step big issues. Um, Tom, you wanna read a little? Uh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. The political environment, I'm talking about the political environment of Hawaii and the underlying social environment is a puzzle. Two questions often arise. What is wrong with today's leadership? And why can't Hawaii do big things anymore? For example, more than half a century after Head Start, why has the state of Hawaii not provided preschool for all? Why are we still talking about it? We're not even close. Another example, why are general assistance payments to the most needy actually lower than they were in the 1980s. Such questions are especially perplexing in light of the fact that much of today's government leadership appears to be well-meaning, more formally educated than their elders, and at least vaguely progressive, most consistently on issues which have to do with tolerance. While the picture is not then entirely bleak, particularly in the areas of gender and racial equity, a trend line I think is visible through the haze. It is about a decline in social consciousness, social activism and political awareness since the mythologized 1960s. It is not for nothing that our work group has worried about the level of devotion to social work. I'll skip on. Uh, the trend lines of the United States as a whole and that of the state government of Hawaii have a roughly similar shape. The qualifier, I, I say, I think is in the 1970s, I think the social justice movement uh, went on longer in Hawaii than it did on the US continent. While the US turned heavily Republican, Hawaii continues democratic party state, albeit through an increasingly numbing one party system. One book end is the liberal state of Hawaii constitution written in 1978. Uh, however, if this observation is accurate, the combined federal state question for social work, social justice initiatives, and for our society as a whole, is whether we are starting on an upswing or whether we are going to drift 
further downward? Are we citizens of a society in which everyone is out for themselves or a society in which people exhibit an operative consent, concern for one another? All of this raises questions about how social work might continue to evolve and how social justice might be defined and pursued. Will the Hawaiian movement prove to be predominantly inclusive or predominantly based on blood quantum? To what extent will Hawaiians followed by non-Hawaiians buy into the culture, tenets and practices of a revised Hawaiian world? What if any accommodation will the US <laughs> federal government and the state government make to this submerged nation of Hawaiians? Will the injustices of the past be seriously addressed or will they continue to fester? Inescapably, the issues of Hawaii and the United States are intertwined. Will the progressive movement in the United States be successfully revived? Uh, if successful, these new programs that are Biden have out, has outlined, these programs could create a wave like that of the New Deal in the 30s or the Great Society in the 1960s. Will today's young social workers recognize the opportunity and will they make the most of it? That's a big question. I have a note here from the um, current NASW Hawaii National Association of uh, Social Workers Hawaii chapter president, letting us know that she and the board are active in maintaining the pulse of social activism across the islands. And they yeah. welcome all social workers and all people to come and join them. So I think that's good to know that the chapter is still very active in uh, many of these kinds of things and concerned about diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, there's um, something that's rolled around in my my heart and mind uh, uh, a lot of years, Tom, and, and when you mentioned some of the conclusion, I... I don't think Hawaii can really progress and move forward until we resolve the overthrow of the Hawaiian government in 1893. I really don't. We've danced around it. We've paid homage to it. But it's never been addressed fully. Um, Bill Clinton and the apology bill, yeah, you know, that, that was kind of weak, but, you know, I, but I, I don't see our leadership in the state, i.e. the Democratic Party stepping up to the plate and doing that because they have bought into a system where they allow lobbyists to come in and and dictate um, what's going on at the legislature in terms of passage of bills, um, and they haven't provided the leadership. I, I thought the other thing I thought is you know the pandemic gave us a great opportunity to reset, right? And we all in the background going, yeah, okay, this is a this is a bad thing, but, you know, let's make a good thing out of a bad thing and, and reset our economy, make it maybe more indigenous. And as soon as the pandemic was over, they just opened up the gates again, you know, and our islands just got literally, literally we're back to the, the model of uh, international tourism. Yeah. Which yeah, brings, I, I call it opening up the gates again. Okay, free for all. And it's really, just, it just is. 10 million people a year to Hawaii, and it's going to be past 10 million. And uh, it, it, it breaks me up to see what's going on in Hawaii today. It really breaks me up. And I, I try and get that to my students at the School of Social Work in my, that my one, 
social action class that I teach there. Um, but that that leadership like Masaro's and and those in in the past is not there to allow that you know kind of social justice action to happen it's just you know like you said it's waned and i don't see any leadership to make that happen again you know you you teach that class every year steve right uh once a spring okay. every spring yeah it's a three credit okay. course master's level school of social work it's called social work practice uh, with communities and organizations that's but really, I, really, I've, I've, I've structured it to be a, a really full-on community organizing social action course. And where do you, you know, Susan and I have both talked about where we sense these different students were. What is your sense? Because you have them at close range uh, every uh, and very recently. Well, what's your take on where students are today and um, what their uh, training and capacity is for taking on these challenges? You know, I've had classes where, you know, I've had like that have um, really bolstered my spirits. I've seen a lot of them in the class that are, are, are really kind of buying into the idea of being a what I call a social work warrior. Um, but there are I have classes that they don't have a clue. You know, they just have no clue. And and I, you know, I, I'm abrupt sometimes and I say, well, what the hell are you doing in my class? You know? Um, and, and I'm I'm really kind of strict that way. And hey, if you're not gonna be committed to some form of social justice, you know, go take go take the other section of, of this class where they talk more about theory and, and, and principles and practice. You should teach it in all the classes, Steve. Absolutely. I want to get away with that. <laughs> I, have, I have one good guy, Alex Santiago. Everybody remember Alex Santiago at all? Yep. He, he teaches a policy class at the School of Social Work. Um, and, and he kind of, you know, he was like in the legislature for 10 years and and abruptly quit because he couldn't stand the corruption there. And I, I really admire um, and, and, and my kudos to Alex for doing that. And, and he teaches a really good um, policy class, um, social work policy class that, you know, incorporates some of the ideas that we're talking about today. Okay, I'm sorry, guys, we have only about two minutes to go. And I want to just um, wrap up and remind everybody um, about the name of the book, <laughs> How Social Work Changed Hawaii, From Practice to Social Justice by Tom Kaufman. It's um, published by Watermark. You can get it through the Watermark website, or in a little while, you can get it from Amazon. Right, Tom? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in the last two minutes, you have any closing comments you want to uh, add before we get bounced off of Zoom? Well, I'd like to thank um, you know the other the other people who are with us in spirit. Our uh, our group, you know, Chris Langworthy, Debbie Shimizu, and Sharon Otagaki. Um, you sort of understated the group process. Uh, I was. I was the journalist there uh, it was, was a little, you know, background in uh, social work. Um, and it was the four of you who uh, really informed and fired uh, this project. And I greatly valued and enjoyed doing it because it struck, I think, it struck a nerve with me as to where we're going as a society. I think social work is so closely interwoven with the whole question of what is the quality of our society? Are we a, um, a, a society that, let's say, is, is everybody out for themselves or is it a society of mutual concern? And um, so I think social work 
is an underexplored, underdeveloped subject, I think it should be given a lot more attention than it's receiving. So I, I welcome doing this. And I thank the both of you. I thank Roger uh, and all the people who joined us today. Thank you. I just hope we can continue these um, conversations in, in some shape or form moving forward. Um, I, I, I haven't, you know, I mean, social workers are the, always the optimists, right? We always have to be optimistic about moving forward. Um, and and I, I'm optimistic that we will, you know, uh, bring about more uh, interest in social justice and social action. Yep. Well, I think I'm very proud to be a social worker and very proud to have spent 55 years of my life in Hawaii and letting, you know, watching the community grow and improve. We certainly have challenges. There's no doubt about that, but there's a great amount of um, effort to uh, improve the quality of life for everyone in Hawaii. And so it's a, it's a great profession and I certainly enjoyed being a part of it. Roger, do you want to say Roger to us? Roger, <laughs> Roger out. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, a bit more optimistic than you guys appear to be right now. Um, I think this is an extraordinary moment in, for Hawaii um, because, because of the pressure of climate change, it's, it's huge changes are, are upon us. If you look at the tourism industry, uh, the entire apparatus of management of tourism is now controlled by Hawaiians. That's amazing, who would have thought? Yeah. Uh, whether the people who own the hotels give a damn is something else, but, um, but I think that's a, a, an amazing thing, uh, an amazing phenomenon and it happened so fast. Uh, I mentioned in, my, in the chat, the Aloha Aina movement, which is really sophisticated in, in, in its approach and did get as far as taking bills, putting together bills for the legislature. Um, and it was very much a grassroots effort and huge. And it was endorsed by all sorts of institutions I would never have imagined would endorse it. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's all, all terrible. Uh, as I said, I think climate change is gonna force some huge decisions and specifically, you mentioned migration around the world. Well, most of our Hawaiian communities live on the coast and they're gonna to have to move. So the whole issue of climate equity is, is gonna come absolutely front and center. Yeah. And that's an opportunity as well as a problem. So that's my two cents. But uh, thank you very much for triggering that thought. And uh, I really appreciate what I learned today. Uh, and uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Roger. Okay. Thanks, Roger. Thank you, Roger. Okay. Uh -huh. Buy the book. It's a good book. <laughs> Absolutely.